It is good to be with you. We've been walking through the final chapter in Paul's epistle, first epistle to the Corinthians. We've been in chapter 16. That is the last chapter in verses 1 to 4. We discovered the purpose, principle, and protection of Christian giving. That's what we looked at several weeks ago. And then in chap the same chapter, verses 5 to 12, that was what we focused on last Sunday. Uh, well, actually, we focused on the last two Sundays in that chapter. It took a little while to get through the six principles that we looked at for effective Christian service. Now, we're getting down to the wire here. We've got just a couple more sections left. And in the second to last section, we're going to look at five imperatives for victorious Christian living. You know, if you think about it, the whole letter, 1 Corinthians, has been very corrective and exhortive and, you know, it's been very admonishing and there's a lot of behavioral problems and sin issues in this church and Paul's been correcting them systematically one by one. Every issue he's addressed and we get down to the brass tacks end chapter and final sections of the end chapter, of course he's going to issue more guidelines or at least some very clear principles and guidelines for how to live and how to give and how to serve. And that's exactly what he's doing. And so today we're going to deal with actual Christian living. And it's not just regular Christian living. It's living the life that Christ has called us to live, a life of victory. So if you guys could take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 16. We're only going to be focused on two verses today, 13 and 14. Okay? Okay. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14. I want to go ahead and read the text and uh, the imperatives that I have for today or the principles that I have for you today, they, they're literally, I didn't come up with wording for them. They're right from the text. And so I want to read the text, then we'll go through each imperative, which is literally the text. But let me read it first. This is the very next thing that Paul says to the Corinthians. Verses 13 and 14 of chapter 16, he says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. And then in verse 14, Let all that you do be done in love. Stop there. Father, thank you for your word and for the ways that we have, the, the graces that we've enjoyed so far, the ways that we've been able to worship you <coughs> just in in song and in giving and in answering prayer requests and praying for those things and the fellowship beforehand and uh, the reading of the word. just it's, it's been amazing so far, Lord. And now we've come to the centerpiece of any worship service, any Protestant worship service, and that is the word of God. That is the, the time of teaching or expository teaching. And so Lord, we want to uh, just commit this particular time, as all the other times and things that we do, we want to commit it to you, and we want to recognize right now that we are fallen and fallible people. Hopefully, all of us here are saved by grace, but we still make mistakes, and we still need a ton of grace, and our heart's joy and desire is to obey you. It's to hear your word, to apply your word, to live your word, and so we pray for that right now. Open our ears and minds and hearts to the truth, and... Guide us with these imperatives. Help us to, to know right here from Scripture, in this particular Scripture, how we can live a victorious life in Christ, how we should walk and live, not as uh, victims per se, but as victors. And uh, I love these final exhortations from Paul. He said some really hard things to the Corinthians, and he said some hard things to us from your word, and we need to hear these things. And I love these final encouragements. And so just may we hear the imperatives, heed the imperatives, and obey the imperatives, and bring you glory in our lives. That's the goal. And so we commit the time to you, we submit to you, we love you, and we pray in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. We can pick up where we left off last Sunday looking at the first imperative from Paul for victorious Christian living. The very first thing he points out is, number one, is to be watchful. Be watchful. You see it right there in the text. I'm calling it verse 13a. There's like A, B, C, D of verse 13. It's really just one verse, but that's the way that I like to break it up. But the very first imperative is to be watchful. 
The Greek word for watchful is Gregor. It's it's like it's a really weird pronunciation. It's Gregoreo, Gregoreo, and we see it probably around 22 times in the New Testament. And it's frequently used in reference to Christians being spiritually awake, spiritually alert, as opposed as opposed to being uh, spiritually indifferent and spiritually listless and uh, list listless and spiritually apathetic. So the the imperative here isn't just hey make sure your eyes are open and you you know you have your head on a swivel as they say or that you have situational awareness. These are all important things in this day and age, but this is a this is a spiritual application here. Be alert in the spirit of God. Be alert in the word of God. Be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of error. Be aware the enemy, be alert, be watchful. Be watchful for theological or biblical error. This is the exhortation. That's the meaning here. Paul is exhorting the Corinthians in this first imperative to be spiritually awake, to be spiritually watchful, just as Jesus gave the same command, the same imperative or exhortation to his disciples, and just as Peter had done with his readers. We see Jesus do that in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 41a. That had to do with being physically awake and being spiritually awake. And then in 1 Peter 5, 8a. So this is a, it's a doctrinal truth. It's a theological reality. It's, it's a verse for us Christians to be spiritually awake at all times. We cannot afford to enter into a kind of a spiritual stupor or spiritual slumber. We must be spiritually awake at all times, alert, listening, paying attention to what's going on and what's being said. And, and there's a, a number of reasons for that. I think, firstly, it's because our flesh is weak. See, the spirit in us is strong. It's the spirit of God. And even our new spirit has been regenerated by the Spirit of God, and it has a strength to it. But this flesh that we reside in is very weak, very susceptible to temptation. And if we don't stay spiritually alert, we end up getting hammered. Or as the Scripture says, we will fall into temptation. Those who are not spiritually watchful tend to fall victim to temptation, to give in to it. We must be spiritually awake because our flesh is weak, because we can easily fall into temptation. We must be spiritually awake because our adversary, the devil, prowls around, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Matthew 26, 41b, 1 Peter 5, 8b. And when we think of the devil who is a fallen angel, a spiritual being or a spirit being roaming around looking for a victim. I don't think that when we see that in Peter, that Peter is talking about unbelievers. They already belong to him. Why would he be looking around for them to devour? He's already devoured them spiritually. He's already using them for darkness. The, the exhortation in Peter, in 1 Peter is, believers, you need to be alert because the devil is looking to devour you with temptation. He wants to throw temptation at you. He knows you very well. He knows how to play your heart chords and he wants to subject you to temptation and get you to give in to it and then make your life and faith a total and absolute disgrace or a mess. So you have to be watchful because we have weak flesh. We're subjected to temptation and we give in to that temptation and we have a very powerful adversary who's always on the prowl with his demons looking for some slumberous saint to victimize. And Paul says something very similar, like he's saying here to the Corinthians, he said something very similar to the churches in Asia Minor, or the church at Ephesus in particular, it was in Asia Minor. He said it like this, put on the whole armor of God. That kind of carries the same connotation if you're putting on armor, you're alert and you're knowing to put the armor on. So it's a very similar imperative. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Ephesians 6.11. So he says something very similar to the Ephesians. It has the idea of being watchful and being ready. In fact, putting on, uh, in, in terms of the Ephesians text, and then being watchful in our text... Those are preemptive terms. 
They show what we must do in advance. These aren't things that you dress yourself in. You don't wake up when the devil's already all over you and got you fallen into temptation. You have to be watchful and alert and awake beforehand. You have to have the armor of God on beforehand. So these are preemptive, preparatory things that we must be alert to and willing to do. We must put on and or be watchful before these spiritual attacks come so that we can be ready when they do. That's the whole idea here. Don't be reactionary. Be prepared and ready to deal with them. That's what Paul was saying. And those of us who have been here for any length of time and have worked through this letter together, we know that the last thing in the world the Corinthians were was ready or watchful. I mean, they were just a basketball on a pro court getting bounced all over the place. If we are not preemptive, if we are not prepared, if we aren't clothed in the armor of God, putting it on every morning in a sense, if we aren't spiritually alert, spiritually watchful, awake, if we're not prepared, it's going to be way easier for the adversary, the devil, to lead us astray. Way easier. And this is exactly what happened to the Corinthians. They were neither prepared nor watchful, and when the adversary sent all sorts of different temptations their way. And if you're a Christian, you're going to get a hundred of them a day. When the adversary sent them to the Corinthians, like in the form of those local philosophers with their false Gnostic teachings and these sorts of things, since the Corinthians weren't watchful, since they weren't alert, they did not stand firm when the adversary appeared in those false teachers. They did not rebuff those false teachers. See, if you're alert, if you're watchful, you, you sense that something's coming, and then when it comes, you rebuke it. You correct it. You stand in opposition to it. That's not what they did. It's because they were not alert. They were not watchful. You shouldn't just be able to stand up to these things as they come. You should be able to give an adequate uh, correction to them, to rebuff these things. And we know the Corinthians did not do that. This place was like a, this church was like a sponge for error because nobody in there was watchful. They were just, you know, living their best Christian life now and doing whatever they wanted and adopting goofy ideas and letting whoever they were exposing themselves to whomever. And I mean, there was just no watchfulness here. Rather than rebuffing the, the, and rebuking the, the false teachers and keeping them at bay and, and not subjecting themselves to these these guys, you know, they foolishly gobbled up all those Gnostic teachings. And next thing you know, in chapter 15, we read that they're tampering with their own doctrine because of those influences. They're now rejecting aspects or components of the resurrection. This is what happens if you're not alert, if you're not watchful. Error comes and you're not ready to stand in opposition to it. And at some point, it has a, you begin to embrace it, begin to parrot what you're hearing. And next thing you know, you're laying siege to your own doctrines. This is exactly what happened there. You know, when they started tampering with the resurrection because they weren't watchful or standing firm or anything like that, that, that wasn't the only terrible result of their slumber in unpreparedness. JMAC provides a comprehensive laundry list in his commentary that shows the broader results of them not being watchful and giving themselves over to the error. He says this, the Corinthians allowed their previous pagan ideas and habits to come back into their lives and destroy their faithfulness to the Lord and their fellowship with each other. They substituted human wisdom for God's word. They were fascist, immoral, and litigious. They had confused and perverted ideas about marriage and divorce and celibacy. And they were self-indulgent and indifferent to the welfare of each other and others. They misunderstood and misused their spiritual gifts. And above all, they were unloving, exemplifying all the things that love is not. I mean, MacArthur in his commentary ties all of those sinful foibles by this group of people, by this ancient church, to their lack of watchfulness because they weren't alert, paying attention, knowing there's an adversary, knowing that they're always being threatened, and they, they couldn't give a response. And they absorbed all the errors and started to live them out. And they even went back to their old ways. 
Now, I get it. When you're a Christian, you know, and you're saved from all this stuff and you begin to make, you know, you, you start to put sin to death and all that. And sometimes later in life, things come back. But, and, and, and you now you're having to deal with former sins and that can happen. Sometimes there's sins in our lives that we get rid of and we never go back to them. But sometimes there are other things that we can do, like attitudinal things, like you might be prone to anger, and later you find yourself getting angry over things or whatever. I get it. That's part of the battle. It's part of the warfare. That's normal. But in the Corinthian church, they went back to everything. You know, they used to be a bunch of party animals, and they turned communion into a drunken party. That's going back to the world in full force. And so MacArthur's absolutely right, and it begins with their lack of watchfulness, in fact, all of MacArthur's points, he, there's all these different points in his paragraph. They, they're all derived from the letter. Uh, uh, MacArthur's points are literally Paul's exhortations and rebukes from the letter. And I suppose the, 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 the biggest point of all would be that the cost of not being watchful can be very, very great. Amen? Uh, the, the, it's, it's a... This is not a small issue. You read that paragraph of MacArthur, and it, it, it sounds like he's talking about the local bar, the running iron. It doesn't sound like he's talking about a church. And, and the first problem the Corinthians had was the lack of watchfulness that illustrates. All those behaviors came in because of that. It illustrates just how important watchfulness is. It's not a minor issue. It's a major issue. I suppose the most watchful people in any church ought to be the elders. And what we see displayed in churches today is that they're sleeping just along with the rest of the congregation and allowing all kinds of horrendous things to enter the church and ravage the church. It's a, it's a sad day, if you ask me. It's a discouraging day. A lack of watchfulness, not being prepared, spiritually alert, ready to go, it, it's a, a very costly thing. I mean, churches are literally destroyed by this. And this is precisely why Paul cried out at one point, 1 Corinthians 15, 34, wake up from your drunken stupor. He's not talking about them abusing physical alcohol there. They're so non-spiritually alert and slumberous, it's almost like a drunk person, a person who's drank too much is, and is in a stupor and isn't coherent when you try to talk to him like, I love you, you know. That's what he likens this to. Somebody who's so drunk, they're on the precipice of passing out. They're completely out of it. In fact, you could do anything you want to them because they're just not there, really. Kind of like Lot and his daughters, so drunk that they can have their way with them because they're afraid there's no other men in the world. And then you have incest. That, that's what he likens that to. That's why he said, wake up from your drunk. They're not physically drunk. They're not even spiritually drunk like in charismatic circles. Drunk in the spirit. It's not, not talking about that. Your spiritual slumber and apathy is like that of an inebriated person. And that's why he says, wake up. We know there's a spiritual difference there because you can yell wake up to a, an inebriated person all you want. They ain't coming too. These people had the ability to come too because this was a spiritual slumber, a spiritual drunkenness, a spiritual stupor. You see, to live a victorious Christian life, we must be watchful. Not just on certain days of the week. Boy, I tell you what, I'm like the night watchman on Sundays. Uh, you need to be the night watchman or watch woman every day. The adversary roams around all the time, every day, looking for someone to consume. If we are not watchful, the devil can catch us off guard. He will, and he can and will lead us into temptation and sin. We become his victims rather than Christ's victors. There's a huge difference. That's the first imperative. Let's move to the second imperative for victorious Christian living. Second thing Paul says is stand firm in the faith. Stand firm in the faith, verse 13b. The faith Paul speaks of is not the faith of trusting, but the faith of truth or the content of the gospel. 
It would be like when somebody says, you know, when they're referring to the Christian faith. When they say that, they're not talking about Christians believing in Jesus. They're talking about the body of principles and imperatives and doctrines that we believe. And that's the idea here. He's referring to the Christian faith and its set of doctrines and beliefs. The imperative to stand firm in the faith, therefore, has to do with maintaining sound biblical doctrine and historical Christian orthodoxy, what we've always believed as churches or as the church. That's what he's, that's the imperative. Stand firm in the beliefs of the Bible, in, in the doctrines of the Bible, in, in the beliefs and doctrines and, and theology that the church has always believed that are taught in the Bible. That's what he's saying. And we know that some of the Corinthians had become theologically corrupted by the influence of their unbelieving friends and neighbors. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 21. And human philosophy had all but obliterated their view of God's word. We know this to be true. Paganism. We know that paganism had strongly re-entered their thinking and that they even dared to attack the gospel at its heart. Claiming to speak by the Spirit of God, some in this church were calling Jesus accursed. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Can you imagine that it's not that you're just, you know, you, you, you're, you're led astray to the point, you're not standing firm, you begin to stand on some other surface or foundation that's a slight variation from the actual truth. We see that error all the time in the church, and we need to really be alert to that kind of error because it's much more subtle. But these people had gone full turbo, gone from praising Christ to blaspheming Christ. How does that even happen in a church? I mean, that's extreme. What Christian in their right mind would ever say that Jesus is accursed? You're supposed to say Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is King. Jesus is accursed? That's insane to me. I just can't even imagine. And that's exactly what some of them were doing. The Corinthians' lack of watchfulness made them a target for the enemy. And their lack of standing firm made them vulnerable to his fiery darts, Ephesians 6.16. And we're speaking again of putting on the armor. You put on the armor because the enemy is going to be launching and assailing you and attacking you with all sorts of malicious lies, false religion in these things. For the Corinthians, their lack of watchfulness and not standing firm. I don't know how anyone could stand firm if they're not watchful. You have to be watchful before you can stand firm. The watchfulness alerts you to stand firm in those moments. And, of course, this is dominoes for them. The end result was horrific. A cursing Jesus? I mean, they were carried away by every wind of doctrine and human cunningness which is what prompted those blasphemous attacks against the founder and perfecter of their faith. Ephesians 4.14, Hebrews 12.2. All Christians are called to stand firm in the faith and to stand firm not just in the faith, but for the faith. We have a dual responsibility, not just standing in the truth of the gospel and the word of God, the promises and doctrines of God, the truth and imperatives, not just to stand in those things, but to, to stand firm in them, but to stand firm for them, to defend the truth. The... Uh, very bold half-brother of Jesus wrote, I appeal to you, this is his audience, Jude 1, there's only one chapter, so it'd be verse 3 or Jude 3. I like to say Jude 1, 3 because it's confusing. But this half-brother of Jesus named Jude said this to his readers, I appeal to you, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That has to do with, you know, of course, if you're going to contend and defend and argue in love for the truth, you've got to be watchful. You've got to be standing in it already. You can't, how can you contend or defend if you're not doing the first two things? 
When it comes to matters of faith, and by the way, when Jude says the faith that was delivered, he's talking about our whole system of beliefs. When it comes to matters of faith, doctrines for which we have a clear revelation of God, such as the doctrine of resurrection, this is Charles Hodge speaking there, we must not budge at all. We can discuss the doctrine of resurrection. We can discuss the doctrine of justification. We can discuss the doctrine of atonement. We can discuss the doctrine of Christ's kingship or Christology. There's a lot, a great many things we are permitted to as God's children to discuss. And those same things are not to be debated. They're settled. It's over. These things are not to be disputed. I think talking about them and discussing them is valuable. Iron sharpening iron. Uh, the books that you read, you know, that the extra biblical books that you read on these fascinating doctrines. I mean, these, these are these are these are a well of wisdom and good resources. But you know, we're, we don't. I don't need to sit with somebody across the table and. Some other Christian, especially, like this would happen in the Corinthian church, and debate whether resurrection is a reality or not. I'm not even going to have that conversation. Or you just blindly believe. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, the resurrection is foundational to my salvation. Why, why are we going to get into that and pretend like it's not real? Why would I dare talk about something like that as if it was only an option or not an actual reality? When, when I do that, I'm calling into question a couple of thousand years of Christian orthodoxy and worse than that, clear biblical teaching. And yet this is what the Corinthians are doing. There's certain things that we just have to stand firm on. There's no wiggle room with them. Suppose this is what baffled Paul the most, because in chapter 15, the Corinthians seem to understand this, but they're wiggling around and messing with resurrection. What they should have been doing is talking about tongues or something else that's an open-handed issue that's perfectly fine to dissect and debate and challenge, but not resurrection. Are you nuts? Or the deity of Christ? That's, that's not a negotiable doctrine. We need to be mindful of how we speak of these things. There's certain things that we just cannot budge on that we must stand firm on. We can discuss them, but we must never dispute or debate them. Life is a vapor. We know this to be true. James 4.14, men come and go. They sprout and wither like grass in a field, but the doctrines of the Bible, the doctrines of our faith, they endure forever, for they are the eternal word of God. 1 Peter 1, 24 to 25, therefore all such doctrines are to be considered settled and no longer matters of dispute. There's Charles Hodge again. And he's referring to the doctrines that they're not negotiable. They comprise the Christian faith. They're not things that, you know, we're going to, we can discuss, but they're not things that we're going to go back on or try to attack or undermine. Yeah, this is what standing firm in the faith means. It doesn't mean that you can't discuss, but it certainly means that you must be standing in and on these truths and defending these truths at all times. We don't go back on these things. But as I pointed to a moment ago, the, there are other doctrines like the sign gifts, speaking in tongues or something like that. They are totally open for dispute because they are not essential or non-essential. They do not constitute or make up the Christian faith like the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ do. I mean, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ are the core principles, core doctrines of the gospel. We can discuss them, but they're not things that we're going to debate or things that we're going to dispute. But when it comes to tongues or some other tertiary doctrine, secondary, third, down the road, you know, way down the line, have at it. 
In fact, tongues aren't even woven into the fabric of historical Christian orthodoxy. They appeared in the first century, and they didn't look anything like the tongues of today, but they did appear in the first century as literal human worldly languages, English, whatever, not English then, but you know, they're regular languages. They did appear in the first century, and then they disappeared for 18 centuries somehow, and then they reappeared in Los Angeles in 1906. I find that to be incredible. And being that that is the historical account of such a doctrine, I think that based on that and how absent it is in the rest of the New Testament, how absent it is throughout church history, I think it's a subject that is up for debate. And I think that if you decide that I don't think it's for today, and I certainly don't agree with the way that people are doing it today, it's not like all of a sudden you're not a Christian any longer. It's not something that constitutes the Christian faith. It's a sub-issue. But there are a whole bunch of other doctrines that are not like that one. Resurrection, atonement, justification, the kingship of Christ. Justification, I think, is one of the biggest ones of all, and it's one of the ones that falls into dispute the most, and it's not even something that we should be debating. We are justified by faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone, according to Scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. That, that's not something that I'm going to sit down and try to dissect. Maybe I'll try to dissect it so somebody can understand it, but I'm not going to sit there and dispute each of those solas that I just mentioned. If somebody doesn't want to embrace that, that's not my problem. But I certainly don't need to go along with them in their error. Anyone who preaches a gospel that's contrary to the one that I just mentioned, at least the doctrine of justification, what does Galatians say of them in chapter 1? They are accursed. Anyone who says we are justified by a combination of believing in Jesus and doing good works is accursed, according to Paul in Galatians 1. Justified by faith alone. That is not a doctrine that we are going to tangle with or play with. It is what makes Christianity distinct. One of the things that makes it distinct from all other religion. Because all other religion in the world says, do your best. Keep going. Maybe on Judgment Day, you'll, the scales will tip in your favor. No, 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 no. No, we're not going to tease that idea, and that is the idea of the world. There are things that we must stand firm on. There are things that we don't have to stand as firmly on. You might just have some convictions about how the doctrine of election works or these other complex, challenging doctrines that have baffled brilliant minds for a couple thousand years to millennia, but, you know... There's a difference. You stand in things by faith and you defend things by faith and what you can't understand doesn't necessarily make it untrue. Just because you can't get your mind around something doesn't make it untrue. And that is a postmodern ideology that we see prevalent today. To live a victorious Christian life, we must stand firm in the faith. We must know, believe, and defend the biblical doctrines that constitute the Christian faith. But since Christ said all Scripture points to me, John 5, 40, we should actually see the whole Bible as the doctrine of Christ. The whole Bible as pronouncing Christ and pushing Christ and showing His work and His future work, His finished work and all of that. The Old Testament talking about His future work, the New Testament talking about his finished work. We're looking back. I mean, the whole Bible is our doctrine. Therefore, we should see the whole doc, the Bible is the whole doctrine of Christ and focus entirely on God's word. We should see Christ on every page and proclaim him from every page. It's possible. If Christ said it all points to me, I think we can preach him from every page and every line. And that's actually what Jesus did. Did you know that? Luke 24, 27. It's also what Paul, the apostle, did. Acts 17, 2 to 3. They preached Christ from everywhere. The believer who stands firm in the faith stands firm in all 66 books. 
Let's move to the third imperative for living the victorious Christian life. Number three, act like men, verse 13c. I think Craig Blomberg might be right. He's a pretty good theologian. He says, act like men. That statement should probably be rendered, be adults. And what he means is that Paul is saying, act like men. He's saying, be adults. Grow up and be adults. Put away the immaturity that has led uh, to so many of your problems and grow up in the Lord. That's the imperative. Act like men doesn't seem very inclusive. It excludes women. And I don't know if that's the best rendering of that statement. So I think be adults, act like adults is probably a better rendering of what Paul is saying because he knew there were men and women in the church, although he's always addressing the brothers in this church in his letter. But sometimes man or men is used as a universal for all, all humanity, including women. So it could be that. But in any case, it has to do with acting like adults. You know, when Rachel and I, there's, you know, there's some things that we really enjoy doing together. And I mean, obviously we're married. We should enjoy all things. Uh, you know, her ladies book club, I'm going to pass. <laughs> Mountain biking, she's going to pass, although I probably should have her with me because she'd say, you're going to break your ribs again as I'm looking at a one-foot jump. I got this. Next thing you know, there's a helicopter coming in. It's like, I had it. But we like to do things together, and one of the things that we like to do is we like to grocery shop together. And like most families, we have to do like 10 stores. So it's an all-day event, and I love going because I know there's going to be a lunch in it for me. Right? So, and don't go grocery shopping hungry. I mean, that's just, don't go to Costco. Well, you could. I mean, then you could just eat all the stuff they put out. But in any case, point being, we like to go out. We like to shop. We like to do these things together. It's a, it's a whole day event, and it's very enjoyable. We do it every two weeks or so. And sometimes when we're out and about, you know, I, I, I've noticed, I don't know if she has, I didn't confer or talk to her about this, but sometimes I'll walk by some adults or something, and there'll be somebody wearing a shirt that says, I can't adult today. You ever seen them? Okay, if you shop at Walmart, every other person has one on. <laughs> right? It's a Walmart thing. I can't adult today. And I look at it and I'm like, I kind of agree. <laughs> I think maybe the last time I saw it was at Walmart in series. I have no idea what that means, but, and that's really no surprise. Now you're thinking, oh, he's attacking series. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, according to Paul, here's the point. The Corinthians displayed a similar attitude and similar behavior. I can't adult. What? You know, if they'd had the T-shirts back then, they would have wear, wore them. They would have been wearing them to Stone Mart. I don't know where they would have went. But... <laughs> the point is they weren't acting like adults. And we see this throughout the epistle, don't we? From forming their own childish little cliques and competitions over their favorite preacher te teachers to turning communion into a drunken frat party. At key points in the epistle, Paul has reminded the Corinthians of their childish behavior. 1 Corinthians 3.1, but I, brothers, there's my point, he always addresses them as brothers because men are supposed to be the leaders. They weren't doing a good job in this church. But he says, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. You're being childish. You're not acting like adults. Again, in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, Paul says, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. Woo. You think he just wanted to talk about how he, you know, look at my transformation. No, he's, he's criticizing them. You're not acting like adults. And, uh, and here's, here's the progression. You, you start as a child and you, you go to adolescence and you become a young adult, a mature adult. And, and that's not what you're doing. Again, in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, brothers, there it is again, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Three, on three separate occasions right there in the epistle, 
He's telling them to grow up. So what we're reading here in verse 13c is nothing new. It's a tradition now. Actually, in verse 13c, Paul is giving a final exhortation to the Corinthians to grow up and act like adults. Because he absolutely knew 100% that the Corinthians could not live victorious Christian lives in that current mode as mere children. By definition, children are not strong. By definition, they certainly are not stable in their thinking. Can I get a hallelujah and an amen? They sure think they are at 16. By default, children are not strong. They're not stable in their thinking. They're not courageous. They're not valorous. Uh, they're not brave, usually. They are actually the opposite of these things because they're young and undeveloped. And, and I would say, hallelujah, that's how they're supposed to be. Right? Now, we don't want them to stay that way, but that's how they are early on. And yet adults that refuse to grow up, they display the exact same weaknesses of children. They, they're not strong. They're not stable in their thinking. They're not courageous. They're not valorous. They're not bold. They're, they're none of those things. They're just like children. How on earth are you going to make it as a Christian in this world if you are not watchful, if you are not standing firm, if you are not strong, if you are not acting like an adult? That's Paul's point. The world victimizes children in a zillion ways. And if we're like children, the devil is going to victimize us in a million ways. That's his point. You know, adults that can't adult today, when difficulty arises, they respond to adversity and difficulty like children. And this just increases their difficulty, and it increases the difficulty of those around them. It causes problems for those around them. I'm not sure if there's anything worse for us than an adult who can't act like an adult. That is a very discouraging situation to be in when you have a friend or loved one who is like that, especially if they name Christ. It's a weird phenomenon for us. Now, by design, God expects children to act like children, and he also expects adults to act like adults. Just as he expects males to act like males and females to act like females. Same expectation. An adult that refuses to adult is actually an abomination in God's eyes because that person is rejecting their divine station and calling in life, whether they're a believer or not. Just as a person that is denying their gender or anything like that is essentially assaulting God and rejecting how God made them. It's a, a really, really big issue. It's not just a cultural issue. It's a moral issue, and it's a biblical issue. But the point being that a, 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 a man who names Christ and says he's following Christ and he's at church all the time and is, it's consistently acting like a child... That, that, is, that is not something that his God, our God, that Christ is pleased with. It's exactly what's playing out in the Corinthian church. And what does Paul say? If he's only speaking to the brothers who are to lead the church, then he's saying to them, act like men. And we already know in some ways those brothers in that church were not acting like men because they were doing things that are characteristic of ancient women putting on veils over their heads while they're praying and doing these things. We learned about that early on. But I think the main point is for female adults and male adults, especially in the church, act like an adult. And it's even way worse when adult Christians act like children because that harms the body you know you look at the Corinthian church it, it wasn't on mission it was a mess 
It wasn't watchful and standing firm in the faith. It was stuporous and being blown about by every wind of demonic doctrine. Why? Because many of its adult members had refused to grow up and act like adults. You know, we're, we're parents, right? Many of us in this room are parents, and you have, a, you have a child or children to nurture and to watch over, which means you have to be watchful as a parent, naturally, because you are inclined and propelled and motivated to protect your child. You see them get too close to the street when they're on the sidewalk. What do you do? Let them run out into the street. You run over there and grab them by one arm, probably dislocate it, throw them on the grass, say, what are you doing? I mean, as, an, as, a, as a parent, you have to be watchful. The same would be true of any Christian. They have to be watchful. But I think to be watchful, you've got to be an adult. Children are not watchful. They don't even pay attention. And that's Paul's point. Children just are aloof and in the moment, and they're worried about the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip in front of them rather than the car that's bearing down on them. You know, if you're, an adult that's, if you're an adult that's not acting like an adult, then you're acting like a child, and you're going to be susceptible and weak, just as children are susceptible and weak. An adult is watchful. An adult stands firm. An adult acts like an adult. Children, however, are unaware of their surroundings or unaware of threats. They, you know, they're cowardly and fleeing and childish, and this is why we have to protect them as parents and as friends and as good citizens. Understand that pastor elders are in the business of helping and discipling childish adults. It's just part of the vocation. If there weren't so many adults, Christian adults, who, you know, if, if, if more and more of them would actually act like adults, like Paul is saying, I think our counseling loads would go down. But I, I don't want you to get the wrong impression that when somebody like me or an elder at this church has before them a very childish adult, which there's no shortage of, it's not like we just say, well, just act like an adult and hit the road. Grow up. That, that doesn't often work. And so sometimes people are so damaged and so addicted to their dysfunction, they don't know how to function without the dysfunction. And it's our job and task to minister the word to them and to try to help them become the adults that God has called them to be. It's, it's part of the vocation. It's part of the job. And it's not part that they teach you in seminary. <laughs> so when you get into it and start doing it, you're going, this is kind of a drag. Because it's very difficult to get adults to be adults when they're determined just to act out their childhood. But I would say at some point, those that you counsel and those that you care for and those that you nurture and those that you minister to, if they're adults, at some point they have to start acting like adults. You can't keep going back to, well, when I was in grade school, I was picked on and bullied and, and that's why I behave the way I do. You know, the minute somebody acknowledges that to me and it's happened before, I say, now that you know the problem, it's time to start working on the problem. We can't keep going back to that as an excuse. At some point, adults that refuse to grow up have to begin to grow up. And in order for them to do that, that requires humility and transparency, a teachable spirit. And those are things that children do not have. And so if you're face to face with an adult who doesn't have those qualities and refuses to embrace them, I don't know where you're going with that person. Paul's not giving them an option here. It's not like, you know, the Corinthians could say, yeah, but you don't understand our background. At this point, I don't think he cares. At some point, the Christian needs straight truth and needs to be called to repent and obey it. The game is over. But, no, and this is true when their dysfunction and childish behavior 
It's not just making a mess of their lives. That's something that I can manage better. But when it begins to spill out and impact others in the church and pull the church off mission and hurt people in the church and cause grief and, and trouble and dissension in the church, that's where it becomes a disciplinary matter. And you start to demand in love. You need to act like an adult. And some people, when you say those kinds of words, like Paul is saying here, it's in the scripture, right? I didn't make this up. But when you use Paul's words on them, you cannot be more offensive to them. You are the most insensitive. I'm not even sure if you're qualified to be a pastor. What's the point? The point is that to live a victorious Christian life, we must act like men. We must act like women. We must act like adults. If we fail to do so, we will cave to the extraordinary pressures of our pagan society and we will create unnecessary trouble in our churches. Let me ask you this in your heart of hearts. You're a believer. Do you want to be a blessing to your local body? To your local expression of the body of Christ? To your local church? Do you want to be a blessing to that body or do you want to be a curse to that body? What do you want to be to the body? To be a blessing, you're going to have to be an adult. And if you're a child, that's different. You can't be the 40-year-old the child living in mommy's basement, sucking off of the church. It's time to grow up. It's time to put away with the past. It's time to get over the hurts and hang-ups. It's time to walk in the grace of Christ. Get over yourself. We act as if the whole universe revolves around us and how we feel and our terrible experiences. Do we not understand that we have been brought into something that is so much bigger than us? The body of Christ with a bona fide real mission that has eternal consequences. Mm. Christ didn't earn for us a victory on the cross and a victory through his burial and a victory through his resurrection so that we could remain the same as we were. We are new creations in Christ. New creations. A little passionate about this subject because it's one of my grinds for ministry. And I have to apply this to myself because there are times where I don't respond to situations very adult-like. Mm -mm. I'm like, eh, that's a child. As if somebody's ripped a toy out of my hand. I have to apply this. Let's move to the fourth imperative for living the victorious Christian life. A little passionate, sorry. I'm going to blow you up. Fourth is be strong, 13D. The Greek word for strong is kratayo. It is frequently used in the New Testament to denote inner spiritual strength. Paul is not saying get buffed at Gold's Gym. Wouldn't be a bad idea for me. There's some value in Scripture to physical fitness. Body is a temple. It's a good thing. Ian, keep working out. It's okay. But if you ever lift those muscles against me, I'll smoke you. He could probably bench press. No, he couldn't. I'm heavy. <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> like, you got to be able to do like 230, and that's not easy. I just told you my weight. Let me hide. It is not talking about, you know, he says act like adults, act like men. And when you think about that, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I need to be strong. Well, he's not talking about physical strength here. He's not. It's usually used in the New Testament in reference to spiritual strength. The verb is in the passive voice. It literally means be strengthened. When he says be strong, he's saying be strengthened. And the fact is we possess no spiritual strength of our own. Amen? Who in here is spiritually strong? Nah. 
And, 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 and my life has proven and my walk in Christ has proven that in the moments where I need to be the strongest, I'm usually the weakest and blow it. Since we possess no, and he's, he's telling them you need to be strengthened, but since we possess no spiritual strength of our own, we can only be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, Ephesians 6.10. We can only be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 2.1. So it is not our part to strengthen ourselves. It is our part as believers to submit ourselves to God so that he can strengthen us. That's Paul's point here. He's saying, submit to the Lord and be made strong by him. He's got the strength. He's omnipotent in power. Flee to him and be made strong so that you can be the adult and stand firm in the truth and, and stand firm in the faith and, and be watchful and all that. That's what he's saying. And actually, the person who thinks he or she is strong in their self is, the greatest, is in the greatest danger of falling, First. Corinthians 10, 12, be careful where you stand, lest ye fall. Paul himself prayed three times for personal healing. He had some kind of, I don't know, demonic thorn in his side, some kind of ailment that was really bothersome, probably one that none of us could stand up to, and he managed to, but he prayed for it to go about three times. And knowing the dangers of pride and self-reliance, the infinitely wise Lord Jesus denied his petitions and replied, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 9, or 7 to 9. You got an instance there where Paul was needed to be strengthened and wanted to just be healed so he could be strong in himself. And Christ said, no, no, because of your thorn in your side, you will be dependent on my power. That's what's safest for you, especially after he received all these incredible visions of heaven and stuff. I mean, that's the context. Now, there's a number of ways by which God can strengthen believers or that he does strengthen believers. He does it through his word, obviously, Psalm 119, verse 28. Therefore, we should regularly engage in reading and studying and applying scripture. Amen? God strengthens us through our, believe it or not, this is the interesting point here, and I drew it out of one of the commentaries. But God strengthens us through our own self-sacrifice, through our own self-denial, through our own self-discipline. In other words, when we're dying to ourselves, we're being strengthened by the Lord. Paul experienced this, didn't he? He was literally made spiritually stronger by God as he, quote, disciplined his body and kept it under control, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. This is another interesting facet to it. God strengthens us as we use the spiritual strength he provides. This is where it's like lifting weights. We grow in his strength as we use the strength he has provided to us. It's like working out. When we use the strength that he provides, right? When we, we utilize that strength and walk in that strength that he provides. When we use the strength he provides, how, how do we do it? What do we do? How do we, what does that look like? Let's put it that way. What does it look like for us to walk in the strength or to utilize the strength that he provides and to be made stronger through that transaction. What does it look like? It looks like this, walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in knowledge of, in the knowledge of God, Colossians 1.10. If we will, and he gives us the strength to walk in him, but if we will do that, that's how we utilize the strength he gives us. Walking in Christ each day, walking in a manner that's worthy of the calling, that is an exercising of the strength that's given. And guess what he will do if we will do that? He will strengthen us with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. That's Colossians 1.11, the very next verse. And lastly, God strengthens us when, what? When believers or when we pray and ask for strength. When David was about to ascend to the throne of Israel, he paused to thank the Lord for getting him through various trials and tribulations. What comes to mind? Saul and Absalom, his son. He had to go through all these things. As he, you know, he's, well, Absalom, I think, came a little bit later, but he had to go through the experience of Saul, the previous king, and that guy was tough on him. He was trying to kill him everywhere he went. And right before he ascends the throne, he's really thankful to God for this. And he recounted like one of his many prayers during that time of extreme tribulation. 
He says this, on the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased, Psalm 138, 3. So David is weakened by his tribulations. He pauses to pray for strength, and God strengthens him in that moment. Paul described why he bowed his knees before the Father and prayed for the Ephesians. Among other reasons, he wanted God to, quote, strengthen them with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. That's Ephesians 1, 14 to 16. Well, that's amazing. Paul is like, I know the, Corinth I know the Ephesians need to be strengthened in a number of ways. And then he bows to his knees and prays for God to do that because he knows God can do it. Isaiah 40, 29, God gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases their strength. We just need to pray and ask God for strength, and he will supply it, just as he will supply wisdom to the saint who calls upon him for wisdom, James 1, 5. He gives it through prayer. He gives it through his word. He gives it through our own exercising of the strength he's already provided. There's a number of ways that God provides his children with strength. You must understand that following Christ is not for the timid or cowardly. It's not. 2 Timothy 1.7, to live a victorious Christian life, we must be strong. But to become strong, we must rely on God, submit to God, and perform the spiritual exercises He has prescribed in studying and reading of Scripture, obedience to Him. That helps to strengthen us. And, and obviously prayer, as I just talked about. Now let's move to the fifth and final imperative for living a victorious Christian life. This is essential. Do everything in love, verse 14. The final imperative here is, is really the crowning exhortation of, of the whole, really the whole letter in a way, but of the section at least. As Paul reminded the Corinthians so eloquently in chapter 13, in particular, verses 1 to 3, that really all things that are achieved without love are basically nothing at all. That's the whole point of that early section on chapter 13. Right? He's talking about love. It's the love passage. In a very real sense, Paul's exhortation, quote, distills the message of the letter into a single sentence, Richard Hayes. Love, biblically defined, and we see it defined in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. It holds the key to every relational problem mentioned in 1 Corinthians. <laughs> the root cause for most, if not all, of their sinful behavior and symptoms in this church, it was a lack of love. A lack of love for God and a lack of love for each other. It's the main pandemic in that church. Love is essential to individual believers, and it is, of course, essential to the body of believers, to the body of Christ, the church. It complements and balances everything else. It binds everything together in harmony. Colossians 3.14, Paul ends his list here of imperatives with love because everything, including his other imperatives, they have to be done in love when we are watchful, we do it in love. When we are standing firm in the faith, we do it in love. When we act like adults, we do it in love. When we seek to be strengthened by the Lord, we do it in love. Everything we do is to be governed by love and seasoned with love. Henry Skogel, one of my Favorite Puritans wrote, Love is the powerful and prevailing passion by which all of a person's inclinations should be determined. In other words, everything we do should be put through the filter of love. Love is what the Corinthians needed most and is what believers of all ages have always needed most. Above all, Peter says, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4, 8. Love, like spiritual strength, it comes from the Lord. As it, is, as it is written in 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
You know, we are capable of loving God and loving one another. Why? Because God first loved us. 1 John 4.19. Point being, to live a victorious Christian life, we must do everything in love. Love is the chief imperative. Love is the highest virtue. It reigns supreme over faith and hope, two other extremely high virtues. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the very end of that passage. What does love look like? How is it embodied, characterized in us? How is it displayed in us? Love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy nor boast. It is not arrogant nor rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable nor resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And on top of all that, it never, ever ever ends. Never. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. If we have potent, very useful spiritual gifts, and, and we do, we tend to, and if we were to give all of our time, all of our talent, all of our treasure, even our own lives, if it were to come to that, to Christ... But if we have not love, we are nothing, and we gain nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 and 3. Do everything in love. That might be the greatest challenge of all. Amen? It is not an easy thing to do at times but it's what we're called to do. And when we fail, we confess it and we repent of it. We acknowledge our shortcomings and our lack of love. We call upon God for mercy and say, make me a loving person to that difficult person. That's what we must do. Do it all in love. If we don't, Gosh, we're not even like God who is love. How could we be unloving? And it's not periodically, but as a pattern and even claim to belong to God through Christ. That's an oxymoron. That's an abomination. There is no such thing as an unloving saint. It's a fact. We must be loving. We have the propensity and ability to be loving thanks to the work of God in our hearts and the Spirit of God in our soul. May we endeavor to do that because that is the crown of all of it. Amen?